It's wonderful to see you all here this morning. Let's go ahead and stand and we will start our service together. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you and um, we are so grateful to be in your house this morning. And Lord, I thank you that um, you watch over your children. And Lord, um, I ask that you would continue to heal those who are in need of healing, that you continue to comfort those who are in need of comfort. And Lord, that you would just be present and close to us in such a tangible way, Lord, that we would feel you near. Lord, continue to guide our steps, go before us and behind us and guard us on either side and remind us of who you are and who you want us to become. And Lord, continue to shape us and refine us and remake us more and more into the image of you. Lord, we love you and we want to give you praise and glory for everything. And everyone said, amen. amen. Let's go ahead and pray over the offering. Dear Lord, as we come to you in prayer, thank you, Father, for our Sunday. Thank you, Lord, for our offering. Lord, bless the gift and bless the giver. And bless those who can't be here today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. You may be seated. Y'all may be seated. It's good to see everybody here today. Welcome to Bethel Baptist Church. I hope you all are having a good week. Uh, so if you're here, I assume, every, I assume you're healthy. Uh, we've had a lot of sickness going through the community, and not just the community, but everywhere. Um, so, but it's good to see you all here today. A couple of announcements real quick. Uh, the weekly schedule is full steam ahead. Everything's back to normal, if you will, uh, as far as our midweek studies, youth group, and everything like that. Uh, so be praying about those things that are going on this week. And it's always, uh, and there's been a few changes with the schedule uh, as far as which days we're meeting uh, in some locations, but, but either way, we're, we're full steam ahead. Everything's going well, uh, so thank the Lord for that. Um, deacon nominations are today. Church members, make sure you get your uh, nominations in. Uh, do we have those, where are those ballots at? Uh, oh, they're right here? Okay. Are we going to hand them out? During the business meeting. Okay, gotcha. All right, so um, we'll do that, uh, and that'll be after service today, correct? Okay. So uh, church members, just hang tight right after service, and we'll get these uh, nominations to, to fill out. And um, so that's today. Youth group, we've already started planning on how to decorate the room here in the back. Uh, we were moving some things around uh, in, during youth group this past week and moving things out, moving things in, making plans on paint colors. And we haven't decided on anything, but we're just, you know, tossing around the ideas, you know, rugs and things like that. So uh, there'll be some changes in that room here in the next couple months. Uh, so uh, but that's another thing to be praying for us there. Uh, as we get that rolling. Uh, the new camera, the recording last week looked better, right, than, than using a phone, so thank the Lord for that, but last week we didn't have the sound portion set up. We were just using the laptop microphone back there, so any sound that that thing picked up, that was speeding through, so it, it didn't sound great, um, but we made some more modifications to our equipment, and we got, the sound should be feeding straight from our microphones uh, into the thing, so it sounds a lot better, at least what I heard, I did a little test this morning. Um, so uh, we're not streaming live yet. We're just recording and then uploading. Uh, Lord willing, next week we will actually stream live as we got to make uh, one more modification to our laptop back there, and we should be good. Uh, so, but be praying about that. But, you know, thank the Lord, everything looks a lot better and sounds better. So, and then also put on here, the new videos will be loaded to YouTube instead of Facebook, right? Because the Facebook app, they weren't updating it anymore for some TVs. Uh, so once we're streaming live, we should be able to, uh, the TVs in the back and everything like that will be able to watch anything that's going on in here. Okay, so uh, that's that's been a change. So thank you all for the support there. Um, that's pretty much all for the announcements. Um, any other announcements, anything we missed? Yeah, just to let you know, we are doing the online service mm -hmm. on Facebook and YouTube. Um, just because we're going to be doing it on Facebook and YouTube. Mm -hmm. 
Man, that's crazy. Wow. Okay. So, uh, yeah, thank you all for the prayers for that. Um, we had gotten that call, was that yesterday, I think I got, was that yesterday? Man, my days run together, but that was yesterday we got the call that, you know, she'd gotten bit by that dog and really messed her up, and uh, so, yeah, be praying for her, and uh, yeah, 53 years. When she told me that, I had to ask her, I was like, wait a minute, did you say three years or 53 years? <laughs> 53 years, the first time she's missing uh, uh, Sunday school, so, you know, what a, man, what a testament to faith that is, goodness. So, uh, but be praying for her in stone, and as you know, she's continuing to heal. Uh, so, uh, let's see. Anything else? Any other announcements? All right. Got whose hand is that? Oh, Grant. Okay. Thank you, Grant. And that's another thing. Mary Jane, we'll definitely be praying for you there. Um, with that, um, as we, you know, we move into our looking at some other things. Yes, we got. Uh, there's been several things happen. Norman, it's great to see you here. Goodness, I mean, it's been back and forth. I mean, uh, we've seen several folks being sick. You know, with uh, being sick, getting injuries. Um, just all kinds of stuff. And the first thing Frances mentioned when I talked to her yesterday, she said, you told us when you started teaching out of the prophecy stuff that some things might be happening. You know, and, and I did mention that, and I'm not the kind of person to say I told you so. I don't want to be that. But, you know, just as a warning, sometimes when we study certain things in the Bible, the devil will come along and try to discourage you any way he can. And if it's not, if it's not, to, not, necessar- if it's not even to discourage you, it's to take your attention, pull your attention elsewhere. Right? And we talked about the links that the devil will go through to, to you know, take our attention away from learning prophecy in the Bible and end time stuff. And, and I tell you, it's been, uh, even with us, it's been one thing after another, you know. Uh, but what does the Bible tell us? The Bible tells us, and, and, and uh, Peter tells us, resist the devil and he will flee from you. You know, but there is that time of resistance. You know, there is that time when you kind of have to, things are tough, and you just got to kind of plant your feet in and, and keep standing, you know, and keep looking forward, even though you feel like falling down and, and, and you know, by the wayside, if you want, if you, if you will. But, you know, just, but if you resist, keep your eyes set on Christ, that he will flee from you, and eventually, um, you know, all these things will clear up, and, you know, we'll, our study will go on smooth, you know, but like I said, there's always that time of resistance, and I, I, I can't say what for 100% certainty that that's what's going on, but, I mean, the Lord has control of everything, but do we continue to pray for one another, because it's been one thing after another with, with folks in, the, in our community, so uh, just be praying, continue praying. Uh, it's never wasted, never wasted time praying one for another, okay, so... Um, all right, any other prayer requests we can add to CW? Unspoken. unspoken, thank you. Man, I have that on here, and I always, that's, I've been forgetting that a lot recently. Um, unspoken, uh, if you have an unspoken prayer request, go ahead and lift your hand up high, and then we'll get you counted, and we'll add it to our list here. I got 28. Oh man, we're way off. <laughs> way different today. <laughs> All right, we'll always go with the higher number anyway. So 32. All right. Um, also, I put on here on our prayer list to be praying for uh, kids going back, getting back into school, teachers heading back into school. It's a, I mean, it's a big um, stressor, if you will, coming from vacation straight back into school, and and uh, you know things. I'm sure things change every year. You go back into school, so uh, let's be praying for our teachers and our youth uh, in that also. All right. Um, Birthdays. We're getting our birthdays here. August is, we got tons of birthdays here in August. And we'll pray over this in a second. But birthdays this week, we have Keisha Williams, um, 27th, Dean McCluster, and that's today. Dean McCluster, 27th. Catherine Siemens, 28th. Stephanie Lane, 29th. Donna Lopez, 30th. Man, and Leslie Smith on the 1st. We got tons of birthdays. So if you see any of these folks outside of church or, or even here, just wish them a happy birthday. Let them know we sang to them, all right? So let's go ahead and sing happy birthday to these folks. <laughs> Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, God bless you, happy birthday to you. Amen. Happy birthday to y'all. All All right, so uh, I think that's pretty much it for the announcements. Um, Go ahead and release children, kids of Children's Church this morning. Is that good? You ready for that? Church and nursery. Church and nursery. Okay. And then... Let them head on out, and then we will pray, and then we'll get started with our study. All right. There we go. 
Hey, buddy. <laughs> Y'all need to take a, take a lesson from him. He's like the happiest person to get in the church every, every Sunday. It's like, man. All right. So let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll get into our study this morning. Dear Lord, as we come to you in prayer, Father, we just thank you for everyone here today. Lord, I thank you for even folks that are here, Lord, that have just recently gotten over some ailments and different things. Father, I thank you that they're here and that you've, you've brought them through, Lord, the trials that they've had to endure, Lord. So I pray that you'll continue to be with them, Lord, continue to lift them up. Lord, we have some new ones, Lord, Francis, and, and uh, Lord, I pray you'll be with her and just the injuries that she sustained, Lord, and others. We have family members passing away, others are sick, and uh, Lord, I pray you just be with each and every situation, Lord. You know what they are. And, um, Lord, I pray you'll just bring them through, you know, the other side. And <clears throat> Lord, I pray you'll be with our study today. Bless our hearts as we hear, Lord. Give us ears to under, uh, hear and hearts and minds to understand, Father. Uh, we love you, Lord, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're continuing our study today in the book of Revelation. We, we've been going through, we, we hit portions of the book of Daniel, uh, talking, laying a foundation for prophecy and end times and why it's reliable and, and all the different prophecies that have already happened. We talked about probability and, and, and just the, the chances that prophecy would even come to pass if, if it wasn't for the Lord, you know, putting his hand on everything. We talked about that and just the astronomical uh, values, if you will, therein with, when it comes to the probabilities of prophecy coming true. So we laid all that foundation, and last week, uh, two weeks ago, we started actually in the book of Revelation. We talked about the purpose that John, uh, his purpose for writing the book of Revelation. We talked about the three parts that Revelation is broken down into. The angel, or Jesus, when he came to John, told him, he said, hey, when you write this, I want you to write the things that you see and the things which are and the things which will come to pass. You know, so three different parts. Jo uh, Revelation chapter 1, jo John was writing about the things that he saw that day, right? The things that he physically was seeing, just like, just like I'm here with you right now, the things that he saw. Uh, and then he says the things which are. He talked about just the, 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 the times, if you will, the church age, all the churches that were there, different problems. So we're, we're in that portion right now of Revelation, John writing about the things which are. And then we'll just briefly talk about uh, chapter 4 today when he moves into the, thing, into the portion of Revelation of the things which will be, right? So um, we'll talk about that just briefly today. So last week we talked about the churches. John was given a command to write several letters to, to seven churches in Asia. Now, there were way more churches in Asia than seven churches, right? We understand that. But there were specific ones that were mentioned out, and, and there's a reason that the Lord mentioned those to John. Because each one of these churches that John wrote, wrote to, we can reflect on those today, and we can see different churches that kind of fit the molds, if you will, of the churches we find in chapters 2 and 3, right? So last week we looked at the, the loveless church. You know how, how the Lord says, y'all are doing great things, but if you don't have love, then it means nothing. And we, we saw that church, and the, uh, Jesus said, you better fix yourself right? Fix yourself or I will, my presence will leave from, from, uh, from you. We saw the persecuted church, how they were just constantly being persecuted, being killed left and right. You know, we talked about how also that, that these churches represent churches today. Persecution, they say, uh, we know the power of the media today. We know, we understand if you pay attention to the news, how selective the media can be, right? They want to, if they want you to concentrate on one thing, they'll show you lots of different articles about one thing, and, and you know, around times of election, you'll see all kinds of political things on the, on, uh, on the media and the news and things like that, but one of the things that's never mentioned is how many Christians are persecuted today. That's, that we don't really, you don't see it unless you really dig through the internet, you can find it, uh, but uh, statistics will tell us that more, per, more Christians are persecuted around the world today than ever has been uh, in the history of the world. I mean, especially in places like India and China, North Korea. Goodness, in North Korea, they're taking kids away, even based on rumors. If one family goes to the government, to the cops, and they said, uh, I, I read a story about this, one family was accused of having a Bible in their house, right, and whether it was true or not, and guess what the government did? No questions asked, came, took the kids, young kids, I think the age of the kids were like five and three, took the kids away from the family and sent them off to a, a, a basically a hard labor camp, right? And, and those, that family will never see their kids again, you know, at least until the kids are older, right? But that's, those kinds of things are going on with Christians. In Africa, goodness, the, uh, the Islamic militants that run around Africa right now shooting up churches. You know, India, there are churches in India um, where people, and this is not just India itself, but different provinces in India, they will stand outside of churches and they will wait for people to come to church, almost like a little gauntlet, like if you had to run up a row right here and then people stand on either side with sticks, beating people going into church. And as soon as they come out of church, those people are still waiting and they beat people coming out of church, right? Christians are persecuted 
like crazy today. And this, this letter to the persecuted church there in chapter 2, um, you know, tells them, man, just hold on. Hold on. You know, uh, Jesus told the persecuted church, I don't expect you to be, and I'm going to paraphrase this a bit. But he told the persecuted church, I don't expect you to be out there door to door, street preaching and doing all this other stuff and making sure you're getting on Facebook and doing all these things. But he told that persecuted church, just hang on. If you can just hang on, then you're going to be fine. Right. Hang on. Stay faithful. We saw the compromising church that, you know, they, they were doing OK, but they made some compromises regarding their their uh, uh, their church, the corrupt church. We saw that, too. So this week we're going to start in chapter three. And the first church we're going to look at uh, is kind of labeled the dead church. All right, so what, what are we talking about here? And again, uh, one thing that's said after each one of these little uh, passages, you know, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. And basically what that means, if the shoe fits, then wear it. Wear it and fix it, right? If you see something wrong, and this, cannot, this can also apply to individual lives. If you see something here that might, might affect your life or be part of uh, what's going on in your own personal life, then yeah, if the shoe fits, then wear it. If, this, uh, if, if, if you hear what the Spirit's saying, then man, make, make a... Make the changes where needed, right? So let's look at here at chapter 3. It's part 7. We'll look at Revelation chapter 3. And, and it says, and, unto the, and to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have, have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Right? So what, what does Jesus mean by that? And he says, um, Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come un upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names even in Sardis who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So here we have this, this church in the city of Sardis, right? And they're basically being accused of not being watchful. They're not being watchful. They're not paying attention to what's going on in their city. Now, the city of Sardis was a city in its history that was easily conquered. Twice before, it was, it was conquered easily, right? Um, it wasn't that the attacking armies overwhelmed the city of Sardis, but what history tells us is that Sardis became overconfident, right? And it's almost like that mentality kind of bled down into this church there in Sardis. They, they just felt like, oh, we're fine, right? Nobody's going to attack us. Nothing's going to happen, right? And that's uh, that mentality, it says, um, historians say, because the overconfidence of Sardis uh, made them stop being watchful. And the spiritual state of the church in Sardis was a reflection of the city's historical character, right? Now, one of the things they used to tell us in the military was that the thing that gets people killed is complacency, right? Thinking you're going to be okay, right? That's, a, that's the biggest killer they used to tell us in the military. They used to always tell us, always be watchful, be watching. You don't know where danger is going to come from. You don't know when it's going to come, but you got to keep your eyes open. It's no reason that, uh, well, nothing's happened in a week, so, you know, let me take a break for five minutes. You know, that, that, that time you take a break, the devil's going to know it, and that's when he's going to come upon you. You know, and, and the devil, the Bible tells us, is like a lion that's, that's walking about the earth, seeking whom he may devour, right? That's all the devil does, right? He just walks, looks around to see who he can attack, those people that have their guard down, they think everything's going to be okay, and that's when he's going to jump on you, right? That's when he's going to come in just like a surprise. You know, those, those animals that, that get uh, jumped on by, you know, if you watch those videos in Africa, you know, where those tigers and lions and cheetahs are, are chasing after their prey, man, a lot of times... The, the, the prey, they don't stand there looking at the lion and say, well, he's coming, I better be ready. That, that cat, whatever cat it is, always jumps out, out of nowhere. And it's like that, that animal, the prey, has to do everything it can just to get away, right? And, and this, that's what the devil does. He just sits around and watches, look, looks to see who's letting their guard down, and that's who he's going to jump on, right? And I'm not saying he doesn't attack those that have their guard up, because he does. But my point is that we have to be watchful. Because anybody that's ready, uh, they're going to they're gonna usually fare a lot better than those folks that aren't ready. You know, I know there's that, I've never, I played football briefly, but um, I know there was the, the worst way to get hit in football is when they come, they come on a side where you're not expecting, right, or you don't see them. That's, that's the worst thing ever. You get laid out. <laughs> I didn't take very many of those, man. I didn't want to play football anymore. But, um, but anyway, yeah, so th those are the worst kind. But if, you, if you're ready to take the hit, yeah, it might still be painful, and it might still knock off balance, but you're – you're more ready to take it, if you will. You're, you're more prepared, right? So that's what's going on with Sardis. In verse 3 there again, it, Jesus is telling them, he says, Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Basically saying, go back to the basics. Remember how everything started. Remember how you started off. He says, um, hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. 
So that's the problem this church was having. They weren't watchful. Uh, another thing, when I, was being, when I was a drill sergeant, one of the, the most important skills we had, and this, this applies anywhere, one of the most important skills that we had to learn, if you will, was, was paying attention to everything that the soldiers were doing. Every little place where they were falling below the standard that we set, we had to jump on. We had to just, I mean, tear them up every single time. Even just the little things, the position of attention, as simple as that might seem, you had to look at so many little details. You had to make sure that their thumb was touching the first joint of their forefinger and that their fingers were curled, right? You couldn't do no weird, like, karate chop thing that some kids tried to do. Uh, you had to make sure their feet were 45 degrees apart and the heels were touching. The feet, I'm remembering all this stuff, the, the, your knees had to be straight but not locked. Your chest had to be erect. Your chin had to be level with the ground, right? Your eyes looking forward. I'll never forget all this stuff that they made us pay attention to so many different times. You know, uniforms, the hat, supposed to be, as they wear a hat in the correct position, the, the level of their hat is supposed to be parallel to the ground, you know. Saluting, man, you have to do all these different things, all these little minor details, right? You have to be watchful of that and correct things. The same thing with the church, you have to, be, you have to correct you have to be watchful of different little things that might sneak into the church. Winston Churchill said to Britain in the early days of World War II, he says, I must drop one word of caution. He says, for next to cowardice and treachery, overconfidence leading to neglect and slothfulness is the worst of wartime crimes. Basically saying being lazy, being overconfident, um, being complacent. That's the worst of wartime crime, according to Winston Churchill. Let's look at uh, verse 4 again. It says, you have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. And there, there again we see that, that same uh, statement. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You know, one thing that's exciting about that little passage there in verse 5, it says, he who overcomes um, shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. You know, one of the best things that, that can ever happen to us in, in this life, you know, is salvation. And I would say the best thing, um, close seconds, get married, your wife, right? Men, write that, note, write that down, take notes. Uh, but anyway, you know, all that to say is, is we get to experience a lot of great things in this life. I mean, a lot of amazing things, a lot of blessings. And of course, life is hard. I get that too. But, the, but I think when it comes time to pass on, you know, and we're standing there before the Lord, and the Lord looks at us. I don't know how it's going to go, but I kind of imagine it going somewhat this way. And we're standing there before the Lord, and he looks at you, and he says, why in the world should I let you into heaven? All right? And of course, God knows. Uh, but, you know, if, when he asks you that question, the Bible even says that any time anyone has stood before the Lord, in any, whether it's been his presence or directly uh, before the Lord in any way, the Bible says they fall down as dead. They can't even speak. Even in the presence of angels, they can't even move. So when we're staying in the presence of the Lord, I don't, I don't feel like, you know, some people say, well, I want to get before the Lord. I'm going to tell him off. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you will, right? If the Bible holds any truth, which it is, right? You'll be so overwhelmed by God's presence that you'll literally want to crawl into the floor. But when we're standing before the Lord on that day and the Lord's asking, why should I let you in? I, I think it's going to be just like this. We won't have to say anything. Right? Who's going to come to our come to our side and and vouch for us? It's going to be Jesus Himself. Just like here, the Bible says, you know, I will confess Your name in heaven. You know, the Lord. So when Jesus Himself is God, our back. And that's why the Bible says, if the Lord's for us, who can be against us? You know, how much truth is there to that? I, my goodness, you know. But one day Jesus will confess our name before the Lord. You know, what a what a a feeling of security that's going to be. You know what I'm saying? Right now we live by faith, right? By faith, the evidence of things hoped for. You know, and the things that we cannot see. The Bible says in the Book of Hebrews. But one day our faith is going to be made real. We won't need faith anymore because it'll be right there. We'll be able to behold it with our eyes and just to hear Jesus, that he has our back and to know it, you know, and to see it firsthand versus it, we, us needing faith to believe that. Right? Jesus say, hey, I've got his back. I've got, I've got Donna. I've got Horace. I've got Marilyn. You know, don't worry, Lord. I'll confess their name before, before God the Father. And there, hey, we'll be in. What a neat, what a neat feeling that's going to be. Talk about the feeling of assurance, you know. Um, that'll be interesting. All right, so uh, the Bible tells these folks in Sardis. So obviously there are some folks in Sardis that were still holding on. They were still trying to do what was right. All right, but we don't want to be the church that is not watchful. We got to be careful about the things we let into this church. You know, one of the things that we've just done was, uh, you know, for our, our, our folks that are working back here with the children, we did uh, background checks. You know, and I think that's part of the things of just being watchful. Right? There's always little ways that the devil can try to get in there and start creating dissension or disagreements or, or anything like that. Right. Uh, and we just have to be careful. You know, we don't want to get complacent and say, well, oh, well, God will take care of us. Well, yes, he will. 
But we also, too, have to use our own common sense to make sure we're not doing anything dumb and get ourselves into trouble or create danger for ourselves, right? So um, we have to be watchful. We don't want to be, uh, we don't want to be the church of Sardis or be like them. All right, let's look at the next church here. We've got two more to go. Verse 7 there says, it says, And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, and he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. That comes from Isaiah chapter 22. He says, And I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. You have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. And this is, this is the, the model church right here. This is the church that you want it to be like, right? You want to be the one that, that, that you are so in tune with God's will that the Lord says, hey, whatever you're going to do, because I know you're in tune with my will and I know you're seeking to do my will no matter what. So that means the Lord says, I'm going to open. He says, he who is true, um, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. Uh, he says there in verse 8, he says, see, I have set before you an open door. You know, this is, our, this is our, our model church. We want to be the church that is so in tune with God's will that it doesn't matter where we're walking. It's almost like the Lord saying, I'm opening the door for you. Nothing's going to be close to you because our desires would be so close to God's desires that it's almost like he doesn't even have to worry. Just open every single door in front of them. I know they're going to be doing what I want them to do anyway. You know, the Bible tells us that if we ask anything in God's name, that he's not only going to hear it, but he's going to uh, uh, complete it, if you will. I'm kind of paraphrasing that. I even wrote it down here. But, you know, if we're that church that's always seeking to do God's will, the Bible says that if we ask anything according to God's will, then, you know, he's going he's to see it. He's going to basically open doors for us. Now, that's not to say, let's say we ask one thing that's, that's God's will, but it's not God's will for another two years or ten years, right? But we're still going to God's, along God's will, but it just means that he hasn't granted it, if you will, or opened that door in that moment. But the point being is we want to be that church that always seeks God's will. There are tons of good ideas out there. That's why, uh, you know, we, we've been talking the past couple weeks about deacon nominations, right? Deacon nominations. You might say, well, we'll just pick the ones that haven't been on. Well, okay, that's, that seems like a good way to look at it. But what we have to do is involve the Lord in all this. Proverbs chapter 3 tells us if we acknowledge him in all, in all things, he's going to direct our paths. And his paths are better than our paths. It might seem like a good idea to select so-and-so or nominate so-and-so because look at all their qualifications. Look how faithful they've been, which is, is fine. But the point is that we have to make sure we involve God in that. We have, to, we have to walk hand in hand with the Lord as best we can because we want our doors, if you will, to always be open to us. You know, we want to make sure that we're walking uh, within God's will because if we're not walking in God's will, then what in the world? I don't want to walk in my will, for goodness sakes. You know how much trouble we get into? Good grief. I was, I was telling that to Angela the other day. She was reminding me of a few things. I was like, good grief. I can't believe I forgot all this stuff. I'm glad you reminded me, right? But, I mean, take that to, e to an even bigger, bigger picture. You know, if we didn't have the Lord and we were just trying to walk along doing everything that we wanted to do, good grief, we'd get into all kinds of trouble, you know. So it's, it's good to, to keep the Lord part of everything. And then he tells the church here, um, which verse was it in? I don't can shut it for you in my name. Um, look here. One of the things he says about this church, he says they have little strength in verse 8. He says, I've set before you an open door. He says, um, for you have a little strength. You know, what does that mean? Is this church is weak? Not necessarily. Uh, in a sense. What does it mean, weak? Uh, when I was reading this, I, this is kind of how I thought about it, right? Okay, let's say that, that um, little straight, okay, let's take our camera, for example, right? We just got this new camera, right? If you compare our little camera back there, recording our sermon and our, our sound system to a church that's got 10,000 people and millions of dollars, I mean, this little camera is little strength compared to that big old church with, you know, a $20,000 audio visual system, right? It's a little strength. But, you know, compared to that big old thing. But you know what? When you, when you take what the Lord can do with even the smallest things, it doesn't matter who's better or worse, if you are, who has more money, or who doesn't have enough money, you know, uh, talking about, you know, re relating that to, to a church. Just because we have a small building or a small little camera or not a good sound system as somebody else, that doesn't mean that the Lord can't use it and magnify it greatly. You know, when we, th we think about that lady that um, in, in the Gospels, when, the, when they were giving their offerings there to the temple and people were coming in, dumping all kinds of money, and this lady came and she gave her two mites. And they stood back and said, hey, she's given more than everybody. It's just because it's the faithfulness. And, you know, we take what we have and we give to the Lord and we let him magnify it, right? This church here, they had a little strength, but the Bible says no door was closed to them. Everything that they did, the Lord was blessing. And God was opening uh, doors for them. And that's the church we want to be like. Let's look at verse 9. It says, Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come uh, and worship before your feet to know that I have loved you. 
Because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. You know what it's saying there in verse, uh, verse 9? You know, there are people that look down uh, upon smaller churches. You'll hear it. If you ever go to a bigger church, you'll, see, you'll hear little comments like, man, I'm glad we got this stuff. I'm glad we got the comfortable pews and the nice plush carpet, right? And you, you just hear all these little things. And sometimes people can take pride uh, in their church, which is okay. But sometimes they can take that pride almost to a level to where they look down on everybody else. Man, I go to this church. You should go there and check that out. They got all this stuff, you know. And, and again, it's, there's nothing wrong with being proud of your church. But don't look down on other people, right? Don't, don't look down on other people that are trying to serve the Lord and just don't have as much, right? So what the Lord is saying here, that there are some churches out there that they look at everything that they have and all the wealth, if you want to say that, that they've been able to amass, and then they look down on other people because they don't have what we have. And, and uh, Jesus is calling them, if, they're, if their motivations are, are in the complete wrong place and they're only serving themselves and not God, the Lord says, I'm going to take those larger places in the, of the synagogue of Satan he calls, and they're going to look at you, and they're going to recognize, one day they're going to recognize that you were the one setting the standard, not them. They're gonna, it says, I will make them uh, worship at your feet. I'm going to make them realize that you were the one that was in the right place, right? And you were the one that is blessed. And that goes all the way down to the personal level, you know, with each individual. I remember uh, in the military, one of the, it wasn't really hard, I don't know. I've always heard stories, and I'm not, I'm not naysaying these stories, but in my experience, you know, in the military, saying I was a Christian around non-Christians, I mean, yeah, you get picked on a little bit, but you know, the people that always stood up for me the most were the non-Christians. Man, let anybody else from outside our group come and make fun of me being a Christian. Man, that, you have three or four non-Christians standing up for me. It was interesting, right, how that, how that worked. And the point being is there is, is that sometimes, you know, we, we can be the person that, oh, who in the world wants to be a Christian? Y'all know what I'm talking about. Why in the world do you believe that silly stuff? Man, when it comes down to it, if we, if we remain true and strong to who we are and, and, and hold on to the Bible, folks are going to have a respect for you, right? Some of y'all that have been around more than a couple years understand this. You hang on to the Bible, and yeah, some folks might poke fun of you, but you, you'll end up being one of the most respected people in the group, let me tell you, right? Hanging on to what's true, hanging on to the Word of God, because you're hanging on to something that, that, that's worth hanging on to. You're not, blowing this, you're not blowing this way and because the, 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 the fad and, and what's popular is heading off that direction, right? You're not, when the wind blows this way, you're not taking off over there. But you're like an oak. You're like a tree planted by the still water, Psalm chapter 1 tells us. And you're just hanging on. And people will see that. They will see how steadfast you are and how sturdy and, and worthwhile and, 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 you know, strong you are as a person. And there's, there's, a, there's a huge benefit in that, especially as you get on into life, you know, having that respect from people. But, you know, people will come, even the big folks, they'll come around and, and recognize, hey, they were right. They were right. And the Lord's going to make them realize that. All right, so, so stay strong in the faithful church. That's, this is the church you want to be. All right, this is the church that you want to be, walking in God's will. Um, verse, we on? verse 11 says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, and uh, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. And I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven, which we're going to study that towards the end of uh, the book of Revelation, the new Jerusalem. It says, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him a new name, right? Um, verse 13 says, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So if, if you're that person, you know, and, and I, don't think it, I don't think any of us have arrived completely, you know, if you will, perfection in our faith. But if you're that person that, man, you, your life is 100% dedicated the Bible tells you, hold fast, just hang on, keep doing what you're doing, hang on, keep going forward, one foot at a time, right, and once everything's said and done, it'll be worth it. That's one thing that's interesting about the Christian life uh, compared to the worldly life, if you will. In the world, you can seek all kinds of things. You can look forward to the, uh, the weekend, or look forward to that new phone that's coming out, or new car that's coming out, or look forward to all these different things. Uh, but what's interesting is psychology says that people are happier when they are during the buildup and when they're hoping for something versus when they actually get it, whatever it is, whether it's a promotion, whether it's that new car, whatever it is, people's happiness level tends to drop once they actually receive what they've been working for. It's an interesting, an interesting phenomenon, right? But then once, when it comes to things of the Lord, the work that we do for God, that's the stuff that's going to last. That fulfillment's going to last a lifetime, right? So hang on. Those that are faithful, hang on. Keep doing what you're doing, the Bible tells us. Now we're going to get to the worst church, the worst one. This is the one you don't want to be, right? Uh, you, you've already seen some of the other churches. We, we talked about the churches that worship idols, right? We talked about some of those churches. They would have idols in their church, worshiping things other than the Lord inside the church. 
There was sexual immorality being celebrated inside the church. I can't even imagine that. That just blows my mind to try to think of a church that operates that way. So we had those, we've looked at those churches. We've looked at churches that have like a hierarchy, if you will, within, within their, uh, their church. And basically what they were saying, the Nicolaitans, they were saying, you can't talk to the Lord unless you go through me first, right? And that's basically how they were holding. And Jesus says, I hate that. Don't be like that, right? Jesus died so we, don't, so we could go to uh, the Lord directly. Not, be, not so we have to go through some priest or prophet like they did in the Old Testament, right? We can go straight to the Lord. So the Nicolaitans, and the Lord says he hates all these things. But now, even above all this, this is the church that the Lord hates the most, the one we're getting ready to talk about. Let's look at verse 14. This is the one you don't want to be, right? It says, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And verse 15 says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. Right? He says, so this church is kind of sitting in the middle. Right? They, they, well, let, me, let me read a little bit more. They're kind of sitting in the middle. It says, so then, in verse 16, so then, because uh, you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Imagine that. I, I don't mind drinking uh, kind of like room temperature water, but I definitely like colder water more and even hot water, you know, water that's, that's on the warmer side. You know, we all like, I don't know anybody that likes taking cold showers. I, I heard it's good for your health. I don't know, but I've, I don't know anybody that likes taking cold showers, right? So you either like the warm water or the cold water. You know, that little bit of the, the, the kind that's right there in the middle, you know, it's okay, it's fine. But most of us generally prefer either hot or cold, right? And Jesus is saying the same thing. I would wish, I wish that you were either hot or cold, right? Now, why is that? And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, verse 17 there says, because you say, I am rich um, ha and I've become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know whether that you are wretched and miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And he says, I counsel you. To buy from me gold refined in the fire. Basically, the Lord's saying, take from me. Take what I have and let me give it to you. And I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich in white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness might, may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. All right, so what in the world is the Lord talking about here? What's this lukewarm church? All right, if you take this over to any kind of, um, um, let's say, let's say you're, you're managing people. Right? One of the, the worst kinds of people to manage are the people that do just enough. Right? If you've ever managed people before, have students that do this, and they'll do just enough, and you know they can do so much better, but you really can't get on them because they're doing enough what they need to do, versus a, a kid that's either failing, right? let's look at that, a kid that's failing, you know what you need to do to kind of light a fire under them and, get, and kick them in the butt and get them going. If you have a person that's on fire and doing well, you know what you need to do with that person. But, but whether it's a student, whether it's an employee, or what, whatever it is, if you have that person that sits right in the middle and does just enough to not get in trouble, right, and get fired, but then also they have an attitude of, uh, that, that can be contagious. If you have that person that only does just barely what needs to be done, sometimes others can look at that and say, well, that person's getting paid the same thing I am, right? And look how much more work I'm doing. I'm going to do what they're doing, right? I'm going I'm to back off, and, and I'm only going to do just enough. Man, and, and that attitude just can dr drive you crazy. Good night. You, and because there's so much more potential. You know, one of the saddest things to see is see people wasting potential, right? Taking what they could be and just backing off and wasting time. And uh, I don't feel like doing anything, right? And that's what the Lord's saying about this church. They're doing just enough to not necessarily get in trouble. They're not really breaking any rules. But at the same time, they're not doing anything to improve, right? They look at everything that we have. Let's say we, we look at everything we have today here in our church. And we'd say, all right, this is good enough. And then the next five years, you, look, you come back here in five years and you see the exact same thing, the exact same schedule, the exact same uh, people come to the church, no more, no less, right? Same thing. You've got the same clock on the wall. Let's say everything is the exact same five years. Okay. Ten years go by. You come back and everything is the exact same. There's, there's a problem there because there's no growth. And why do I say that? Because when people come in and out, you're going to have changes. That's just, that's just how it is. Right? When people come in and out, you're going to have different strengths and, and, and different weaknesses coming in and out of the church, and you have to adjust to it. But if you, make, if you make a framework within any organization that never changes, there's no room for growth, there's no room for input, there's no room for cutting something out that shouldn't be there and adding something better to it. If there's no framework for anything like that, man, you're, you're not doing too well. That is not a place to be. You don't want to be, that, be in that place. Um, I even knew, uh, knew of a pastor in South Carolina. You know, we've talked in here you know, in our business meetings about how to, how to uh, you know, let's say handle members that are living in sin. And that's, that's kind of an ongoing process. But I only bring that up because I know of a church that this pastor will remove, will, will seek to remove people from the church if, if they've been there for two or three years and it doesn't look like they're growing. 
He will say, I am not doing you any favors. You are not growing in this church that I can see. I'm going to ask you to leave and go to another church. I'm, I look at that and that makes my eyes go this big. But at the same time, I kind of see where he's coming from. He's an old retired colonel. And he says, I do not want to see you in a place where you're not going to continue to improve in the Lord. He says, you need to get away from me and find somewhere else. And I was like, man, that's pretty bold. But that, that's how he would do things. If he didn't see you were growing, he would fault himself almost and say, I'm not doing you any favors. You go find somebody else to, to learn the Bible under, you know. And, and, but, but there goes that principle. You know, we have to continue growing. We don't want to be the lukewarm church where we just sit and then nothing, you know, that's, that's it. You know, we have to continue looking to improve and maturing and all these things, right? That's just, that's just the way of life. If you look out there, if you see a, a kid, you know, it's sad that we see these things. But if you see a kid who's not maturing physically, you know, there's a problem. You look at that, man, there's a problem. Well, they're healthy. Well, they're, they seem like they're doing okay. They're eating. Well, that's fine. But they're not growing like they should. And that's what this was going on with this lukewarm church. They weren't growing like they should. They were, they were just, like I've been explaining, staying within a certain framework. And they weren't neither hot nor cold. There was nothing to correct. But at the same time, they weren't really trying to achieve anything. They weren't trying to grow. And that's the church. Jesus said, I, I want to vomit you out of my mouth, he said in verse 16. In verse 18, he says, buy from me gold. He says, get my wisdom. If we're seeking the wisdom of God, guess what's going to happen? You're going to grow. The Bible says that as long as we stay with the Lord, he's going to give us increase, right? The Bible tells that in the Gospels. And that's what we want to do. And he says, take from me gold. You know, get, take what I'm giving you. He says, so that you can be rich. He says, white garments so you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with salve so that you may be see. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. So by, Jesus is saying that I, I'm only telling you this, and I'm only, it says, I'm rebuking you and chasing you because I love you. That's one thing you have to always keep in mind with the Lord. Sometimes say, man, why is the Lord punishing me? Well, take a look at your life if you think that's what's going on, and fix whatever needs fixing, right? The Lord only does these things because he loves you. It's not because he's some God sitting in a corner just waiting for us to make a misstep, and he's all happy. Yeah, I get to whip this person today. That's not what God does, right? No, no sane parent is like that. A parent that loves their children tries to correct them. Verse 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And this church is, it's almost like they've even cast Jesus out of the church. Jesus is outside knocking, trying to get in. He says, If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. You know what that tells us in verse 20 is that Jesus is looking forward to spending time with us, right? That's one thing we have to keep in mind. Anytime we start pushing the Lord out, it's not like the Lord just kind of goes away. Well, fine. Right? He's, he's going to sit there and knock on the, door, on, the, on the door of your heart and say, hey, let me, let me in closer. Let me help you out. Verse 21 says, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. And here we see this phrase again. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Again, if the shoe fits, then wear it. All right? That's basically what that means. So this, comes, this is the conclusion of what John is writing about the church age. And this is the age that we're living in now. And anywhere you can look, you can find churches like this. And if you, if you don't know of any churches like this, then you can look around and you'll find them, you know, somewhere. All, right? All these letters that were written to the seven churches of Asia apply somewhere in this world today. You can find them, right? Uh, but, I mean, pray for these churches, right? Pray for churches. Pray for, uh, you know, every church needs prayer. Pray for all the other churches in the area. You know, spend time doing that because we're all here for a reason. The Bible tells us that Jesus is walking in the midst of all of us, right? He hasn't forsaken us, but we have to keep praying for one another because the world's against us, let me tell you. And it's becoming more, more and more so every day, right? More and more so every day. I don't, I don't, I don't look forward to the life. I, heard, I still feel silly saying this because I heard this when I was younger, and I used to think adults were crazy when I, ah, whatever, you know. But I used to hear when I was young, I don't, I don't envy the world that you're going to grow up in. And, you know, he was a young guy. I'm thinking, like, ah, oh, who cares, you know. Uh, toughen up, you know, <laughs> being ignorant, naive as a kid. But now here I am saying the same thing to our kids. You know, looking at the, the world that, you know, my boys and uh, Ariel are going to grow up in, and I see Caitlin, Samantha, Nick, and Trey, man, the world that y'all are going to have to grow, uh, you know, mature in. And then not only that, but our grandkids, good grief. You know, the way the world's going, you know, the world they're going to have to grow up in. But, you know, stay strong. Keep praying for one another. So, so this concludes the church age, and I'll, I do want to point this out, and we'll hit this up next week. It's, oh, I don't even have it up here. But as soon as we get into chapter 4, the very first phrase that says in chapter 4, after these things, right, after these things. So now John is going to start writing about the things which are in the future, basically. These are the things after the church age. In, verse, in chapter 4, it says, after these things, after the church age, it says, then he looked and beheld the door standing in heaven. So now John goes into a vision, looking at, the, looking at things after the church age, right? And he's going to get a vision of the throne room of heaven, which is uh, really interesting. I almost started to go into that today, but I was like, you know, there's so much detail to find in this short chapter that uh, I don't want to just, you know, 
go quickly over it. You know, it's going to be fun, you know, getting some pictures up and really trying to paint a picture of what John is seeing, you know, here in the, uh, in the future. I think it's the near future. So anyway, strive to be the faithful church, right? Strive, we got to strive to be the faithful church. Uh, we, won't want, we have to be watchful, you know, look around, make sure the devil's not getting in anywhere. Uh, we see any kinds of little problems, man, we got to fix them quick. And we don't want to be the lukewarm church, goodness. We don't want to be the church that always thinks, oh, we're just good enough, right? Never seeking to improve, never seeking to grow, never seeking to do extra, right? Looking at, well, the same deacons always do everything, so we'll just not nominate anymore. They're pretty good. Yeah, don't do that. You know, there's always room for more, right? We always say when I was putting in the bulletin a couple weeks ago about ministry, there's always room for more folks to serve. Just because we don't have a committee or, or just because the nursery staff and the kids staff, let's say, has enough people or just because Sunday school has enough teachers doesn't mean we can make room for more. OK, there's always room to serve when it comes to the Lord. Right. So always just seek to improve. Don't be the lukewarm church. Be the faithful church who, as we continue to walk, God's going to be. Yep. Open the door for them. Open that door because they're doing what they need to do. Keep opening doors in front of these people. That's the church we want to be. Right. Oh, OK. You know, sometimes I get to talking a lot, and I think, man, have I been breathing or breathing? Because sometimes I'm done, I'll take a big sigh. I'm like, wait a minute, have I, am I blue in the face, and I didn't even notice it? All right, so take a big old breather. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Um, like I said, pray one for another. I'll go ahead and turn it over to the musicians. Go ahead and stand, and we'll close out the service. I hope you all having a good Sunday today. Hope you all, like I said, be praying one for another. Lots of folks need prayer. 
and be proactive in your prayers. Pray for folks when you don't think, well, nothing's happened to them, but pray for them anyway. You know, pray that God just puts a hedge of protection around us all, keeps us from harm, keeps us from evil. And if, if it's the Lord's will for us to fall into trials and, and hard times, then pray that the Lord gives us strength to, to keep walking, right? So be praying. There's always something to pray for, right? If you say you don't have anything to pray for, then you're closing your eyes, willful, willfully closing your eyes, right? So pray one for another, all right? So um, that's all I had. Members, don't forget, we got the deacon nominations right after this. Uh, so just stand fast, and we'll get the ballots uh, passed out, and we'll be done, all right? Okay, let's go ahead and pray, and we'll be done. Dear Lord, as we come to you in prayer, thank you, Lord, for our Sunday. Thank you, Lord, for what we read in your word today. Lord, I pray you'll give us a heart to, to recognize problems we might have, whether it's at the church level or individual level. Lord, and just see what we can improve. Lord, I pray that we'll always seek to improve, always seek more wisdom, always seek uh, to continue growing, Lord, in your love. And help us to recognize when we stray from your path, Lord, and help us get right back into it where we need to be. Protect us, Lord, as we part ways. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.